Cheers to episode 57. Cheers. Cheers. Coffee. Pink lemonade. I have a high noon of grapefruit. Delicious. Mm. Mm. It's a lot better than watermelon, so yeah, pretty good. Oh, wow, you don't like watermelon. Are those the ones I left at your apartment? Uh, you did not leave these here. Oh. Have you drank you all those? Uh, Corona seltzers. Did you drink your right. your birthday Corona gift seltzers. of all the Jaeger shooters yet? Uh, we all took them together. Oh, f- mm. you're right. Well, we did do that. <clears throat> yeah. I forgot that because I didn't take mine in the apartment. I took it to the bar and use it then. Um, tonight, it, this evening, is Sunday, January 30th. 6 30 p.m a unique recording time on me work schedule for the week is weird this is the only time i could really do it unless we wait till wednesday uh so i know people are anxious to hear evan's thoughts on stafford you will hear them more so on the next show but evan let's start the show really quickly really quickly with um give us a statement on if the rams were to win what you think about stafford and then follow up with if they lose just so you cover your bases this is like a little part of my take action. This is yeah, good. like yeah. <laughs> when they win, um, it's finally deserved that Stafford get a recognition for winning an NFC championship. Um, he has all the accolades, he just doesn't have the hardware. If they lose, first season, first tryout for the Rams, made it to the NFC championship game. It's gonna be tough that he lost at his home stadium, but I think next year will be even better because they'll bring in better weapons. Okay. <clears throat> Some would argue they have great weapons. So I'm what? saying Odell's going to stay for a whole year. They're going to sure up the offensive line. Von Miller will probably take a veteran discount, stay again for a whole year. Well, you've really thought and this out. Run it back. <laughs> Evan's a Rams fan. At this point. <clears throat> I am not. I'm a Stafford fan. Okay. Fair. Let me lay this on you. The San Fran Cisco 49ers. And the Green Bay Packers, it's reminiscent to the 2019 NFC Championship. And the Niners just go in there and they win in a blowout. And they just destroy the Rams. Evan's thoughts. Mm. How well does uh, Stafford play? Stafford's a f- uh, he throws two interceptions, but 250 yards. Uh, and it, he's a fraud, basically. The, the narrative is that we knew he couldn't win the game. What is Evan's thoughts? And the pick was a pick six, one of them oh. was. Um, I will not put blame on him. I'm just going to rally and say, you know what? I think collectively as a team, we got to play better. Didn't live up to the hype. Uh, LA fans got to show out better. It's supposed to be 65% 49er fans. You know, just as an organization, we just have to get ready for that opportunity. Football in LA is still new. Ish. Um, I mean, he gosh. throws four touchdowns, zero picks, and they win by 25. Is he better <laughs> oh than. Oh, my God. Is he better than Mahomes? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you will not hear the end of it. I mean, Dan Orlowski would be the biggest preacher of all time, and I just can't wait. Hey, Nate Burleson's a big preacher, too, of Matthew Stafford. So uh, Former teammates makes a lot of sense. Uh, Orlowski breaking out the Top Gun jacket was a little weird. I'm just going to say it that. Was I don't lot. know what he was doing. It was, doing. was, it was a little weird. It has no like, correlation for Stafford and Dan Orlowski unless they dress up as like Maverick and Goose one time. Yeah. But, that's the only. That's why I heard someone say like he's he's like the goose to Stafford's Mavericks. Like he just feels like he's riding this co- dude's <laughs> coattails hard. Um, Evan, I just need you to know something before this mm-hmm. game starts. Um, if I say mean things about the Rams, they're not directed towards you at all. They're just, just simply directed at the two others that are being <laughs> relentless in the chat right now. Just don't say anything mean about Stafford. That's I might I say some mean things. No, he later. doesn't do deserve it. Evan, Alex, nice is, Alex's dad hates Stafford. No, he, he doesn't hate him. He's just he does. disappointed the Lions didn't do enough with him. Garrett willingly paid for season tickets with Joey Harrington, so he had it coming. <laughs> Come on. Uh, he had the tickets before Joey. <laughs> if if Stafford gets blown out and looks bad, we should have we should have your dad on just to get his just hit the, the old the old man's take of like uh I'm not yeah, sure he can is, figure out how to get on the pod. This is this is the quarterback that he's always been. We knew it. Um, let's do some things differently because this is one of the first times we like have done a reaction right as a game wrapped up. So we'll get into our weekly recaps at some point in the show. Maybe we'll close out with it. But I just want to dive into what we just watched. I'm actually, I'm actually stunned. Like, I know that might be 
over the top. I was just sitting there and I, again, we, I, for those that don't know, I had this like kind of fake Bengals fandom, you know, the, the yearly, the yearly routine when our team sucks and gets eliminated that we just pick a team to root for. And I told you guys, I became a fan of them week 17 when they beat the Chiefs. I watched every snap of the game. I fell in love with the offense. Jamar Chase is incredible in that game. And I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm going to ride this team. And I cannot believe that it's culminated in the Super Bowl. There's so many crazy narratives to this game. If you look at the list of quarterbacks in their second year in the NFL who have made a Super Bowl, it's all Hall of Famers. And then there's also Colin Kaepernick. Like, it's all, it's Tom Brady. It's it's everyone. I think it's Roethlisberger. It's all future Hall of Famers. And Joe Burrow is now in that list. And, like, going into Kansas City, having beat them twice. Joe f-ing Burrow. Holy cow. That dude. I'm just rambling. I'm making no sense. He's a winner. I mean, he just simply wins. I, I don't, I don't know what to say. He made some gritty plays on with his legs. He's just, he's just a winner. Sometimes leadership and other things matter more than uh, actual athletic abilities. He's pretty athletic too. The, the collapse in the second half. Um, it started at the last play of the first half. Andy um, Reid, clock that, management that, god. That blunder is going to come back, and everybody's going to circle that blunder. And instead of either kicking a field goal or or trying to throw the ball into the end zone, not lateral, uh, left points out on the board right there. And then down the stretch, you know, Mahomes getting cute, play calling getting cute. You're on like the five yard line instead of just running just the ball. Can't just run the football, <clears throat> man. Ugh. Play callers love NFL play callers. They love throwing just the football no matter to- what. They fell in love with throwing the football. It's every play caller's stream. It's just football guys. They try to outsmart everyone. Just run the it's ball. It's just really weird to say that the Bengals are in the Super Bowl. Like, I just can't doesn't wrap my head around it. right at all. No, because... Like, it's cool, but <clears throat> doesn't feel normal. Yeah, it's going to be super sick, but, like, it's almost a little premature for this team. Yeah, they're young. They're, they're talented. They're way ahead of schedule. Yep. <laughs> like, yep. I don't know if it's like a... What I sh- sh- are they this good? I mean, I don't know. It's super weird. I'm stunned. Are. I'm still stunned. I cannot believe it. I can't believe like they beat the w- Titans, right? I mean, yeah, but you think about they're okay. We don't need a ricochet shot. Evans, one of his other teams, you know, it's come okay. on. But I'm just trying to be honest here. You think about other sports and like when you get a young core like this and they have a natural progression. Like, remember the Cubs? The Cubs like got better, then they made the playoffs. They didn't quite get there, and then they finally had the year where it was like, all right, this is our year, and we make it. Or the, the Astros, too. Like They kind of putts around the playoffs a little bit, and then they won. Like The Bengals just the, – part of my language, but Super Bowl. The, the Bengals took a, ripped off the condom, and they just did it. They just did – they did the playoffs raw, and they're in the Super Bowl. It's insane. No training wheels, no nothing. And, I mean, what was the, what was the path? Who was the first team they beat? The Raiders. The Raiders. The Raiders. And then the Titans. I mean, the Chiefs, I would and, say they'd have an easy path, but they they just went into Arrowhead and yeah. beat the Chiefs. And the narrative, that, like, that's and it. I know, so I got to do. I know it's an AFC Championship game, but like, no, nobody really thought that the no one felt good that the Bengals were going to win this game. This was like a foregone conclusion. I mean, everyone said, "Oh, last week was our Super Bowl. The Bills Chiefs was our Super Bowl." Like that. That basically decided it. That's crazy. They the they AFC were, is loaded. They had two wins. Talent. Two years ago, they had two wins. They were the worst year in the Joe league. Didn't, Joe wasn't there yet, right? Yeah, that's, they, they got they the got, first pick. They got the first pick. And then they got Joe, Joe got hurt and didn't. Won four games last year. It's really yeah. his first year. His yeah, basically, basically his, his first, like first year full season. In the NFL, he's in the Super Bowl. Yeah, the kid wins. I don't know. And, I mean, to go back just to the game a little bit, I mean, we all here thought this was headed for a blowout at 21-3, right? Or even 21-10. Um, I was hoping the second half I didn't have to pay too much attention to it. So I could get back to my normal, regular scheduled life. life, And I uh, thought it was going to be 35-10, and then all of a sudden, uh, Chiefs scored three points in the second half and blew it on the uh, the last possession of the first half. Yeah, my brain is not in the mood to, or not in the mode to think about the X's and O's really of that game, but did you guys see anything that happened like defensively for Cincinnati? Like, what, what did they do in the second half that was just like, the Chiefs forgot how to score points? Bad play calling for the Chiefs. 
I don't know. The Chiefs just looked out of sync in the second half. You had Tyreek Hill and Hardman going at it on the sidelines. People looked True. mad. When Mahomes threw the pick, Kelsey looked dejected like the season was over. I mean, the the body language, I thought, for the Chiefs in the second half was terrible. Once the whole, like, you know, the wheels started turning, the comeback started. The Bengals, they never thought they were out of it either. I mean, they always thought they had a good chance. You could tell the energy levels between the teams was much different. Especially the second half. Just crazy. Um, I don't think they really did anything. There are probably small, some small adjustments once you break down the film. Um, Dr. Patrick Mahomes, there when the game got close, I wouldn't say like the first couple of drives, but interception I think got him huge momentum. And obviously, the last play at the end of the first half is like big momentum where you stop them from being down three scores. You have all the momentum. They, <clears throat> they set it out of the break of the TV saying that they were down 11. And it was the same point spread that they were down uh, in week 17. So it's yeah. just like that, those small little things to just to spark something in people, uh, you know, turnover by Joe could have been bad, but then you just get pressure on Patrick Mahomes where you seem like he was trying to do too much where it was his rookie self. where he's trying to scramble instead of just, taking what the defense is giving you or throwing the ball away. It's so week one through six Mahomes at the end of that game. He yeah. started getting cute with his feet, trying to do too much. Guys weren't getting open. He's holding the ball too long, taking bad sacks. Let's let's try to tie in our team like it was usually with the playoffs of anything you kind of, when you watch this game, thinking about the Lions ever one day getting to the spot. The thing that it cemented in my mind again is like, this, the, our team, the Lions, really needs some dynamic edge rushing options. Like you watch Hendrickson, you watch Hubbard, you watch Chris Jones, Frank Clark, you watch all these guys make plays in the backfield, and that's just like something that the Lions need so bad. Um, and with that being said, though, I don't. I know the easy answer to refute what I'm about to say is, oh well, good luck in another Joe Burrow. But I will say the Bengals lightning fast turnaround does give me hope for our franchise you got you have to have a quarterback in the nfl correct a you good, can't a, a play with top 10 one. the Bengals <laughs> tried though they played with a wide receiver and it went horrendously like two i'm years. talking <laughs> i appreciate the sarcasm but <laughs> a top 10 quarterback up, man. that can uh accelerate a rebuild joe shiesty you know and all the Bengals organizations laughing at everybody the making fun of them taking chase over uh yeah, penny soul. Yeah. Penne pasta. You know? Obviously, they're probably going to draft an offensive lineman in this draft. You know, that's what I think they have no year. choice unless they want to get Joe Burrow killed. There's an um, obvious option. Uh, but hey. And then. It, it's mind blowing, really. It's just hard to think. Like, I'm, I'm still stuck. Next week, like, oh, when God. we're talking about the Super Bowl and like the matchup in a couple weeks, we're, we're going to be talking about the Bengals. And the Rams. And the wow. Rams or 49ers. <laughs> oh, Alex, you had to do that to me. And also, it's like another thing about organizations, which is huge. Like the Lions historically have been known as like kind of a joke of a franchise, like the upper management. Cincinnati is not known as some like well-oiled machine franchise. I know they've made a couple Super Bowls, unlike us. They make the playoffs a lot. They don't even have an indoor practice facility. They only practice outside. Like they're not some amazing... Yeah, they're not some amazing team with great ownership. They're typically cheap. They they've had they had what Marvin? Who was their head coach? Marvin, Marvin Lewis. Marvin, Marvin Lewis. Lewis. For he years. never won a playoff game. I think he was like zero and thirteen in the playoffs or something crazy. Shout out, shout out Zach Taylor too. Isn't he another McVay disciple? He is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought he's a Shanahan disciple. McVay. I get confused. It's all the same tree, though, because McVay is Shanahan. Uh, you know, you know the young need, super genius is football. Need, yeah, he comes tap, from there. We need to tap into that brain tree at some point. He coached at Ohio State as well, I believe. That could be Fact completely check wrong. That. Fact check um, that. I'll Fact that. check that right now. Stat it up. Zach Taylor. All right, Alex, you do that. Um, that. And then my last thing, <clears throat> again, you know, we don't want to overshadow the great game that was played, but dude, Tony Romo again, man, I just this can't disgusting. do it with this guy. I don't know if I'm so alert to it now because we've publicly made our stance, and now I think, you know, we have friends of the show, Cody with, with the K. You know, he's on the hate Romo train. It's like, 
It's insane. He was doing the same thing that he did in the Bills game when when Joe Mixon broke off that run. are going to the Super Bowl. Like just Adley McPherson is dialed in. He's gonna be able to kick this. Like I don't know, man. The guy just Uh, so sped up. Myself. Okay, lay it on us. Well, he was the Big Twelve Offensive Player of the Year in 2006. That's pretty cool. But he was an offensive coordinator at Cincinnati, not Ohio State. Oh, so he actually worked for the best team in Ohio. So he actually worked under Mark Antonio. Worked under Brian Kelly. No, he was he was in 2016. Uh, the OC at Cincinnati. Ooh. Uh, oh, his they, progression is extremely fast. They yeah, should build a, they should build a statue for him. Cincinnati that's six college years. coach. Six years here in the Super Bowl. You're Dolphins assistant quarterbacks coach for one year. Dolphins quarterback coach for two years. Offensive coordinator for the Dolphins for a year. Cincinnati for a year. Rams for two years, and he's now a head coach. Did, did Stafford? Did Stafford always wear that arm sleeve? He didn't wear that in Detroit. Oh uh, no, he didn't really. Ellie's wear it in changed Detroit. him, man. <laughs> he might have his last Good. year. Hey, Aaron. So yeah, um, Zach Sorry. Taylor was a Big Twelve Offensive Player of the Year for Nebraska. All right, yeah, he lost the Big Twelve Championship game in Arrowhead. Wow. Wild. What are you listening to the broadcast, man? Come on. Tony told you that. I do not like listening to Tony. Jim Nance, listen. To be listen. honest with you. You know, there's moments where Tony Rome was like insightful and he made like the whole point Fine. of a color commentator is that he's supposed to make like the listener smarter about the football and what's going on in the field. There's moments where, yes, he makes me smarter, so it's not that bad. But his worst are the worst. Dude, when he couldn't say Tracy Wolfson at the end of the first half, and then he just Tracy goes, Tracy Wolfson, Wilson, Tr- Trace. <laughs> ah. That's exactly what he did. He just stopped talking and went, ha, and then it went to the play. <laughs> I'll give him credit. He boom roasted himself. He made a joke yeah. at the end there about, Come on, guys. But about dude, the fumbling The worst snaps. part about that was Jim didn't pick up on it, and then like three minutes later, he's like, Jim, you didn't hear my joke <laughs> about myself. Hey, Jim, yeah. did, did you hear my joke? He stinks, Evan. He's not good. There's no he, broadcast duo like that's like good. There's no we've, broadcast duo. We've kicked there. off in LA. Oh, that just sucks, man. Do you guys just see Michael Buffer doing the announcement? I guess LA. No, bro. it's super LA. Um, ah, bro. Let's roll on into the main entree of the show, the college basketball game that Evan was in attendance for. Um, Weekly recaps. Yeah. Should we do. Oh, yeah. That's just how we should do it. We should, yeah. Evan can talk about the game. Well, my week was kind of boring, you know, uh, <laughs> didn't really do much this week, you know, s- said goodbye to Wyatt. You went back out to Albuquerque on a road trip. Um, God speed Wyatt. Yep. I did tell him safe travels, but I'm taking that statement back after how he's acted today. <laughs> oh my God. Well, and then, uh, you know, school, just boring stuff. And then uh, Saturday, just an absolute electric factory. We'll get into more details once we touch on the game. So you guys had a fun, exciting weekend. Yeah, no, we, we did. actually did. Did some skiing. Some... I drank a lot. Um, my brain's Could probably tell. working fifty. A lot is an understatement. Fifty percent capacity. Whenever you're wearing like a tri-colored lion starter wind jacket with no shirt underneath and a bright orange beanie with ski goggles on, and you're inside, you know something is either gone tremendously right in your life or horribly wrong. <laughs> and uh, was I mix doing both. That. Um, the most fun part, I think, is we played this fun game. Uh, at the very end, when it kind of got dark on the mountain, where myself, um, chaotic, this is chaotic. Mitten, Mitten Money co host Evan and uh, Alex would start and we'd get probably like a hundred yard start. And then our friend Ben, who is probably definitely likes to go the fastest of the group, he would basically try to catch us all down the hill. And we and were if going to beat one of if he beat the our first place finisher, he wins. Yeah, so it's just like, can he catch up to all of us with the lead we get and pass all of us? And you win if you do. And we were doing this on runs that were like blue and greens that were very crowded at this time with like people heavy traffic, know, like people falling. It was very chaotic. Intersections, <laughs> people crossing into this hill. Did, did we come off as kind of uh, jerks for just buzzing by people? A little I bit. Was I was <laughs> inches from some people. I'd I had, fly by on their left or right. 
I had you never ate it right in front of me. I had never had to do like on your left or on your right. Had to do that several times playing this game. Just a little heads up. But to be fair, for those who are like, oh, you guys are menaces to society. We only did this for like five times and we stopped and finished out our night. But that was probably the most memorable part. We only lost once. A lot of snow driving home. Yeah. Shout out to dude Sam that hosts the Airbnb. Lovely place. Uh yeah, shout out getting on lifts with random people and then the awkward like conversation you have while you're riding up. You don't know the guy. So you you ski a lot? No, <laughs> not really. Yeah, first time out for me too. Just you know, super awkward. I also super almost lost, awkward. I also almost lost his toes. We almost uh, didn't have him there for the whole day. Cut off my circulation on my feet pretty early on. Couldn't get my boot off. Feet were purple, but you know, figured it out thankfully. And sweet Rough transition, start, though. sweet transition back to the game. It wasn't as bad watching your team get dusted when you're, you know, sitting in a ski lodge enjoying some beer, and then you can go back out and ski more after. So, <laughs> it was the inevitable road blowout that we can't. Well, I was, I was hammering that, especially when they were playing bad when we did the initial preview. Yes, did I think it'd be a little bit tighter um, now that they had been looking better and making their shots? I did, but. I will let you guys, the victors, start with um, your your good or bads or whatever ta- main takeaways you had from the game before I get into like the the bad Michigan points of the game. AJ Hogard, good Hogard Army stand up. <laughs> Said your only take I can tell you about him. Um, I was just going to had first. the best uh, game of his career so far. Uh, Ten assists, no turnovers, facilitated the offense well. The way that we handled Michigan's defense, pull Dickinson away from the basket, and he led the offensive charge in transition and in the half-court offense. At times in the first half, it didn't look like we had control. Um, but there, once you get momentum, once you get scoring, I think a lot of things are easier. And I think Walker did a decent job, but he had a couple turnovers here and there. Uh, but Hogarth, zero turnovers. Love to see that. Great game from him. One minor mm-hmm. stat correction, Evan. I'm looking at college basketball reference. It says he did have one turnover, but I'm willing to pretend that he didn't. The broadcast even said that we just watched not that long ago, Grant. Um, they had zero turnovers. Irving yeah. Match Johnson so, also tweeted so, out that he had zero turnovers. So. Yeah, so maybe, maybe, he, maybe there's something going on here. I don't know. Regardless. Maybe, yeah, who cares? He had, he had a also, great game. 11 and 10 and 2. Max Christie played really well. I thought he carried Michigan State in the first half, making shots. That was inc- really crucial. Five of eight was from playing the field. Pretty well in the first half. Three of four from three. 16 for the kid. Three rebounds. I'll just be the stat guy when you guys hype someone up. Yeah. I thought I mean, he had a gritty performance. The first half was just intense and electric. The atmosphere was great. Physical. Uh, little late. I don't, not Physical super game. late arriving crowd, but everybody didn't get to their seats until like after tip-off. Um, it wasn't as tense as 2019 Michigan Oof. game, but you could still feel it in the air. Uh, best student session performance of the year so far. I mean, but when Michigan want to come out for warmups, uh, was there a lot of duck chance? There was not because you don't really know what to say with the duck chance. There's a lot of people. There's people wearing the duck onesies, people wearing duck shirts, duck face masks. Um, you know what it would have been electric if someone organized this? So this is a chop whoever leads the zone. If you did like the quack Mighty Ducks chant where it's <laughs> slow builds like quack, quack, quack. And then it just builds. That would have been incredible. So credit. That needs to be clipped somewhere and sent to for future reference. Evan, do you say any harsh words to Bo Borowski now that you got a chance to be <laughs> very oh, close to him? Bo show in person. I was. I knew that he was going to do this game because he hadn't done it all year. Um, yeah, I think this is the second game for us this season. Didn't you do the Kansas just, game? Oh, I don't remember. I was, I was thinking of Big Ten games. So First Big Ten game for sure. And I just knew, and then I saw him come out. I was like, okay, great. I did not say any harsh well, – I, I didn't say any harsh words. I was too close to, like, people Tom. in front of me, not students, where, like, okay, like, well, what's wrong with this dude? Why is he screaming like this? Um, so I didn't say anything too harsh. Grant and I did do a film review of you also. Yeah, we have some some notes about the, the, the crew because we watched the it back. squad. We watched oh, it back wait. and watched you guys. Um, I'm sure you probably saw me standing just like this most of the game. Yeah, unless Joey Hauser hit a three and you'd hold your hands up for a long time. 
Also, the milkman had a great game. He did. He did. Joey he, had a great second half. Also, let's see, fourteen points, two assists, two rebounds, two of three from. He had an eight zero run himself. He had a big little run. Evan, why did uh, you bleep his name out? But wear black. Um, he was gonna wear white, but you know, okay, so I'm gonna backtrack here. Uh, we got in line super early. Uh, probably two hours, a little before, a little over two hours before the doors opened. Uh, doors opened a half an hour earlier than expected, Alex. Good news. FYI, uh, they, we were actually walking in the doors at 1030, wow. uh, below freezing temperatures, lost feeling in my toes right away. You almost <laughs> lost your toes too? Yeah, looks yeah. like we almost had to get new toes together. Yeah. Um, got in, sat down. Got situated, and then it's like in the game where you're so cold from standing up the air, like you're just like, okay, I just want to be warm. And the said he didn't want to take it off because now he started sweating so bad. Oh no! <laughs> pit, that pit just, situation. Just, just gonna leave it on. I don't blame him. I don't blame him. Not everybody's wearing white. It's not that big of a deal. Um, but before we get into like players, I would say the first half, I thought Michigan like executed the game plan perfectly. Um, to some extent, we had turnovers. We had I think six turnovers in the first half. Um, some bad, some really bad ones. Um, the one that's obvious is Marcus being on like the outlet pass and gets picked off. Or those like are the ones that I, I lose my mind over. Yeah, the JB um, turnovers. I have an expand on that game plan. Like, what did you see? Like, I, I just they made the game into like a half court offense. A I don't think fest. Michigan State had that many transition points in the first half. Uh, they really slowed it down. Michigan got to the foul line more more consistent than Michigan State did. They probably outscored them, I was guessing, during the game, probably like six or seven points from the free throw line in the first half. Michigan had eight points off of turnovers for Michigan State. Um, it, it was just a competitive back and forth where the game was in their grasp still to where, okay, if you're going to upset your know, favorite person on the road, you got to be in close. Dickinson controlled his own Um and I thought uh, DB tape actually was out really hustling Bingham um, anytime that was a matchup. Just wanted the ball more at situations. And so I thought there, I thought the first half was, I was nervous at halftime. I should say that. Yeah. You look nervous on film. It's because, like, I, I we're going to probably get into a little bit of Caleb Houston. He's not 6'8", just so you guys know. Uh, not even close to six eight. I don't give him any more inches over six six. Okay, I didn't know which way. I didn't know if he like was lankier and longer. So no, okay. he came out and I was like, "That is not Caleb Houston. He does not that tall. Not that tall." Um, but it's like when they came down the court, Michigan. A lot of times they would set this like double stagger string or like a Dickinson would set a drag screen, and a lot of time Dickinson's telling Houston to clear out. Yeah, and instantly as soon as you tell somebody to clear out, you're avoiding that person in the offense. It's kind of hard to get somebody in the offense if you're always constantly telling them to clear out to set up like a two-man or three-man pick and roll. I thought Michigan was running through Dickinson way too much. I mean, he he played all right. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but. yeah. Let me. I'm trying to think how I want to visualize or verbalize it, but like we all know that is their plan. They have to. You want him touching the ball as much as possible. Of course. But it, it almost seemed like Evan said in the way like too ISO, too ISO-y and – uh, credit to the Michigan State defenders of the variety that guarded him. They they didn't because in the past, like last year, I remember we went back and forth. Do you double? Do you not? <laughs> it seemed like from what I watched, it wasn't much doubling. It was just not kind much. of it was just pl- try to move him off the block as far as you can for the catch, which they did a good job of. Uh, and he's going to win some battles and he's going to lose some. And I would say overall, like you look, you just look at the box score, you see twenty five and six. You're like, wow great game but i would just say it was a good game for dickinson because the efficiency of 42 percent shooting for a big man is not That's what not you great. want you want you know to be in the f- 50s at least um so and and the glaring thing is you've seen some of his games where he has five plus assists he had one assist so the game plan for michigan state was we are going to tell bingham to like use whatever energy you have you know because he's been up and down this year like we need the best Bingham, and d- did did he get got sometimes? But overall, he played a fantastic game defensively. So that, and obviously, he's not going to stand out in the box score with the uh, whole points area. But four blocks, I mean, B- Bingham played a fantastic game. 
Yeah, I think Michigan State decided that if they were going to lose, they were going to lose down low. They weren't going to lose from like a barrage of Michigan threes. That's just how it felt. Because if they never really doubled Dickinson, they were willing to go one-on-one with him. And he's obviously going to hit baskets. He's a seven-foot, you know, top player in the Big Ten. But I think, you know, Michigan State was confident enough in their bigs. And they also did all get into foul trouble, I'm pretty sure. Didn't Bingham had four fouls. Marble had four fouls. Soko would come in and he was just instant fouls. So they were just trying to rough Dickinson up a little bit, I think, as well. But they didn't want to lose on the perimeter. Caleb Houston... When we were just watching the first half, he barely touched the ball. Like they weren't yeah. even trying to like get him looks. They it was just let's go to Dickinson and see what he can do. Almost like every possession. Yeah, I I wish there was more scheme for Michigan of getting Houston open looks. Like I think I'm looking at this shot attempts now. Dickinson shot 19 times. Um, Houston wow. shot six, and he had three three point attempts. I would have liked that to have been like five to six three point attempts in like ten total shots. Like just take away. He some. probably had four of his shots in the last seven minutes. Yeah, he got he got to eleven points, but it was all at the end and kind of the mop up time. So I don't, I don't know. He just he wasn't on his game. He had been playing fantastic as of late. It just wasn't there. And then also another thing we have to note, and I think we knew this going in, is like the depth on Michigan's bench is just not even close to Michigan State. I mean, you look at Michigan State's bench. You guys got twenty six points from Malik Hall and Hogard combined. So. Malik Hall's I mean, a starter, but you know it's he just doesn't physically start. Yeah, he does. I mean, he was top four on the team in minutes, so yes, he does play starter minutes. But just having that, I don't know. Even just and Hounsel gives you fourteen. It I mean, like those your kind bench of, points for sure. It's weird though. You look at the numbers. Obviously, Christie had sixteen, but if you told me Gabe Brown had nine, Tyson had seven, and Bam had four, I would not have expected Hauser, Malik, and Hogard to combine for all those points. I didn't. I would have looked at him like okay, and you see Dickinson score twenty five, but. It just, it was weird because like watching it as as I could live, I kept saying to myself like the game, basketball is a game of runs. Like I'm like, at some point Michigan's going to go on like a 9-0 run in the second half and like make it a five point game, a four point game. It just never came. It never happened. No. Like there was no, you know who, oh, when we were watching back, Alex, good point here for a player too. And it's not like a knock on him. It's just what it is. Eli Brooks just did not have a good shooting game whatsoever. He Bad had game. several he had open time. open threes. He did. He had six assists, so he did other ways. But you count on him being like a 40% three-point shooter, and he did not shoot great. And a couple of his threes would have really helped with the momentum. The dagger, the dagger was the Gabe Brown three uh, deep from one. deep over Dickinson. That was like, I, I saw that going. I go, there's, there's no comeback left. It was just kind of sad after their impressive first half of the competitive level to not have like a nine Oh run in them at some point in the second half to make it tight. I have two things I'd like to add one. Brandon Johns deserves to be chopped. Oof. What is wrong? He, since the tournament, he has been garbage for Michigan. Not, not the same kid. Um, and then second is a question for Evan. Um, is the Gabe Brown current trend alarming? Should we hit the panic button? He's been struggling quite a bit. Shooting the ball, getting looks, forcing it a little bit. I mean, it's going to look like he had a big game because he had the two two big dunks and the, the deep three, no. but I mean, I, I think I he had nine points no, I under 50%. I wouldn't say it's alarming. This is Gabe Brown. This is what he's done his entire career. But uh, we need him to be the alpha dog. Do and we I'm need not him sure. to be an alpha dog? I don't know I mean, this that. team That's, is totally is fine biggest... being collective with the team true. scoring and not like a superstar on the team. He, he doesn't have enough moves to where he can finish, where he can you can draw up plays for him. He's a three three point shooter as his mo. Three and um, D. He doesn't really play defense that well, Alex. Uh, mm, I think he's gotten a lot better. Well, it, it's pr- uh, it's a lot easier to get a lot better when your worst is like a trash can out there guarding somebody. <laughs> so, I forgot you really you really hate on Gabe Brown's defense. <laughs> um. I don't think we need him. No, like yes, you you want more out of him. Does he need yes, to be a double digit scorer every every game? Does he need to be our leading scorer down Absolutely. the stretch in the Big Ten tournament? In the tournament, yes, he needs to find double digits. But he doesn't need to be the go to guy. Is what you're saying? Correct. With- he does not need to be the go to guy. I think the go to guy is obvious. There's two go to guys, and I, they're front running right now, and it's obvious. I agree. Gabe Brown is not a go to guy at this point. I think there's one. I think it's Max Maxwell Christie is the guy. 
And I know I would say Max Christie is a go-to guy, and Lee Hall is probably also Lee Hall is the other go-to guy. Yeah, <clears throat> Max Christie is the most talented basketball player on the team, no doubt. I think you needed. Get, now he does have duds, like if you look at his box score. But if you look ever since the Penn State game, 17, 11, 21, 16, 6, 12, 2, 16. But the, throw out those two, which you can't just throw out, I guess, because they weren't good. But he's the trend. If he if he scores a decent amount of points, double digits, 15, they're winning. And then if he doesn't, they lose. So The thing with Max Christie is he doesn't even shoot the ball that much. I mean, for a guy to be a go-to guy, you'd expect him to shoot quite a bit. He doesn't really... He's not like going out there forcing looks and trying and to find shots. And they're not asking him to, which is no. which is good because they don't it's have to. It's a team. To. This is a basketball team. It's not just one guy, which I like. It's mm-hmm. a change of pace. You just need Gabe Brown. I was thinking about this, trying to compare to a guy that I watch. Like you, you just need like Gabe. You could you, this team could win and go pretty far in the tournament if Gabe Brown is just giving you like Sean D. Brown production. Like make your threes, get get ten to fifteen points, be an energy guy, a leader. Make I was gonna say high- senior year Matt McQuaid. Get sick highlight plays. Like they don't need him to like be pumping out fifteen plus points a game. No, I agree. I just wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page. Um, but you might though, because obviously you can't expect Joey you Hauser and Malik either. Hall to go two for three from three every game. Like they're gonna have nights where they're just not hitting. We saw Joey. I saw Joey Hauser miss like five threes against Butler in a row. So like, it, it water does find its level, goes up and down, but. The one one X's and O's thing I wanted to get into briefly, it's just really frustrating. I don't get it. Like last year, we watched this Michigan. The biggest problem with Michigan is their defense is horrendous. Right Pick now. and roll defense, bad. Okay? Like the amount of times that a guard, Hogard or Tyson Walker, like split split a double team or split a screen and all that. So like Michigan last year with Dickinson. Dickinson is not a mobile guy whatsoever. He can barely jump. That's why Beam's able to block his shot sometime because Beam's got a little bit of bounce in him. And he's not good. Like, Diab- Diabete can move his feet and, like, at least, like, rattle guard when he guards him. Dickinson can't really do that. And last year, what we would do on screens is Michigan would do drop coverage where you kind of sag uh, the big guy and kind of just what, what Illinois does with Kofi Coburn. And it worked. Well, he didn't play against Michigan State, but it has worked against Michigan State and other teams where you kind of just he lingers around the free throw line on a screen. You sag. You don't let the guy get to the rim. They kept showing like they were playing show coverage with with Dickinson running up there to, you know, not full hedge, not like a Medi Sissoko full hedge. <laughs> like uh, they just kind of put your hands out there and he'd either be a step late or he tried. They try to ice him and force him to go the other way. And then he. Like Hogarth could just dribble around him, or they would just split. And it's like I don't know when the switch happened schematically, where we weren't drop coveraging Dickinson. And I, I I don't understand. Like I would, my goal going into this game was one of the the keys we made the graphic. I was in my mind, I was thinking, do not leave the shooters in the corners. Have Dickinson sag, and you put. Hogard and Walker in the positions around the free throw line to have to make a play, like hit a floater, do something. Instead, they brought him up to get up involved in the screen. And then how many times did we just watch Hogard or Walker basically have a free layup? Like they just right in layup. So I don't understand that. And I would like to see it change because I don't think Dickinson that's, I don't think that's putting Dickinson in a position to succeed. Agreed. A hundred percent. Like, I don't know. Understand. Oh, go ahead, Alex. I'm sorry. No, you're good. That's all you were going to say. No, I, I don't understand why they would have Dickinson hedge so much or show so much as you said it. When, like, Michigan State point guards, yeah, they're better, like, on the drive. They're not better shooting from the perimeter. They're, they're, yes, Tyson Walker is can not make, a perimeter shooter. Tyson, no. Tyson Walker can make a couple threes here and there, but I would just, I would have, I would have had Dickinson play off, like you said, sag or drop coverage, and then either slide through the pick or go over so you're chasing the point guard every single time so force him off that three-point line now you have two guys like for him to show now you're going under and they were just they split it multiple times or they would just beat the big man around so now you're even more out double out of position yeah. I, I i would have dropped dickinson and gone under every screen when it came to the point guards yeah. until tyson walker made two threes and then i would say okay fight through the screen Devonte. Fight through the screen against Tyson Walker. Still go under, under, yeah. under everything under, for Hogan. If AJ starts burying threes, then it's just not your night. <laughs> I you just tip don't. Your captain women say, "Congrats, buddy." I don't yeah. understand. Like, I, 
it's weird because one of my I was like, all right, you can beat Michigan State. You have to try to make the point guards beat you, and they did. But like the strategy was like horrendous to try to let them beat you. I didn't I didn't like it. And then again, um, we kind of know this, but it was alarming. Like there was got a lot of guys graduated from last year, but like the transition defense, that's just like kind of an effort thing and communication that was just so horrendous. It wasn't as bad as you guys said in the first half. But like the wheels just came off. And a lot of that too was like Michigan. I wrote a bad thing, just sloppy turnovers, man, in the second half. Like the wheels, like I kept, I said earlier, they just came off. And then when you have a turnover, obviously your transition defense is going to be much worse. But where does where did the teams go from here? Unless any anyone had any other main takeaways from the game? I'm just trying to think. Like, let's look at the schedules briefly. I had Michigan, a main takeaway. Oh, hit me with it. Uh, we just we just made it seem a little bit like it was Michigan that just played really bad. I think we should give Michigan State some credit as well that they they did play well. They they executed the game plan. The point guards as like inconsistent as they can be, I do think they are like they do have a lot of talent and they actually played to their potential in this game and that helped. And Michigan's defense was bad and Michigan did play bad as well. But mm-hmm. Michigan State didn't play terrible either. No. And I think the biggest compliment you can give, and it's not some sweaty schematic thing, is like the motivation from whatever the motivation was, you know, it's a rivalry game, the um, not playing the first matchup yet. Like they really channeled that as about as good they as they could, it. as good as they could, especially in the second half. It was just a different, different uh, energy level between the two teams. Like Izzo was showing, I know he always shows emotion, but like a, t- a ton from him. Um, and, and it wasn't a for, foregone conclusion because in my mind, I'm like, all right, well, if I'm Michigan, I'm still going to come out with a chip on my shoulder because the, every, the, everyone's saying that you docked us, you docked us. So, like, they're going to come out fired up. And I think they did. It was a like, talk about, so one of you said physicality of the game. Holy cow, it was physical that game physical. Game. It's unbelievable. It did kind of turn into a ref show in the second half, especially watching it back. There was a whistle, oh, whistle yeah. like, every, all every possession. Show. I saw two of the worst foul calls of all time. <laughs> what were they? If, like, when, was it Marble? Was it Hall? Which one are you talking be, about? Maybe it was being posting up just like an arm bar on Dickinson. And Dickinson slaps it away. That was and Sissoko. Then they call the, fo- the, the foul on Sissoko. Yeah. That is that is Charmin soft. I think what they I think they said it was a jersey grab. We they showed a replay when we were rewatching, but yeah. The, it the was, dumbest part about that was Sissoko's hand was there the whole time. They didn't call it until Dickinson purposely slapped it away. It. Yeah. And yeah. then they're like, oh, you know what? That is a foul. It's just come on. Just be consistent. Big Ten refs are so garbage. Both ways. What's your other one, Evan? There was well, what was? Oh my gosh! I was. I remember that one. Now I lost a train of thought. Just got all high about it. Yeah. Um. Or was there any other atmosphere notes, Evan? I mean, we know how loud it was. At least not sounded on TV. But was there any hostility? Good trips? Did you see any dust up between Saudi Washington and? uh who was the Michigan State player that I read that they got a Gabe little dust? Brown. Gay Brown. Oh, there was the uh, there was a timeout. I think it was in the first half. It was in the first. It half was the first half. half. I see. Yeah, I saw half. a tweet. I think Solari uh, noted this or Couch, one of the two. The, your, your assistant coach was going after a ref about like a a uh, a foul or a call or something, and he was the one getting up in the ref's face. Mm. Um. I kind of looked away from it, but he was still jawing at him for a while. It's kind of weird to see assistant coach get up in somebody's face like that. And he got, he had kind of had to get pushed back Um, at the end of the game. You know, it's getting out of hand and that the trash talking that you're kind of seeing on Twitter now for, or the clips from it uh, between Houston and Dibby Christy. and uh, Christy and Hall. Uh, it's rivalry. I mean, you battle for 40 minutes. I live, I live for the expected. trips. Yeah. Um, being so close, I like being behind the home bunch because I can just hear what Izzo has to say to his players and to his assistant coaches. And um, don't put your kids behind the bench because you hear everything underneath the sun. <laughs> everything. That's awesome. Uh, any good quotes? Any good quotes? I mean, he yelled, f- yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> that well, was he like, does that every game. He turns no, to his assistants all the one. time and he just puts his hands up and he's like, what the? is he doing out there you know <laughs> he does that all the time he's never happy uh he he got at excellence. the end at the end of halftime so right no at the end of the first half right before halftime you know how like everybody's walking to the the, the tunnels yeah uh 
Izzo, Bo, I think he goes up to Bo goes up to him and he's like quietly talking to him like, oh yeah, that shouldn't have been a foul, you know, that should have been a foul. And he's like, all right, yeah, 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 like a nice, nice little conversation. And then the person that like didn't that called the foul, didn't call the foul on Walker, but called him a travel at the end of the first half. Mm-hmm. He goes up to that short ref and gets up into his face <laughs> and points at him right at the right at the scores table. I said that was. A, Effing foul, and then just walks away, and I was like, "Holy cow!" Could have easily got a technical there. Um, and I think what may have helped it just from watching again, I, you know, that they they cut away, so we don't see everything. It seemed like a relatively mild, um, antics game from Dickinson. Like I've seen him, like Indiana, if he, he did wasn't. what he did at Indiana, like dropping the the hammer down and pumping up the student section, like the away student section, it was relatively mild. I think because you know. I think him and Bingham probably respect each other because they have had some pretty good battles here the last like year and a half. So I think he was just there w- wasn't nothing. But oh, he's, he's- Bingham and uh, uh, what's his name, Kobe Buffkin. They're kind yeah. of talking trash the first time Kobe checked in. They're both from the Grand Rapids area, mm. uh, so they probably I know uh, friendly your- banter. But when they were out there, right when Kobe checked in, it did not look friendly at all the way that they were talking to each other. Does Caleb hype- Houston talk trash to people, or does he just talk trash about himself to <clears throat> himself? I don't really know. At the he, end of the he game, was I jawing think, quite a bit during. You could the hear game. some. We were watching it back. You could hear the because CBS puts the mics on the rim, and you could hear some like "Let's go," some "And one." Mother. You heard a bunch of "And ones." The only thing yeah. I could think of was like, at the end of the game when it was kind of a blowout, and Houston scored like an "And one" on Malik Hall, and Hall got called for a foul. Houston said something to Malik Hall that snapped Hall because <laughs> Hall responded right away, and then the ref stepped in to hey, cut it out integrity of the game but you know what i call five terrible calls a game so yeah um so i think in another note that came out of the press conference so we'll see if it comes true uh, i saw also rico so connected they asked a reporter asked dickinson they're like does this one sting more knowing this might be the only time you see them this year and he said oh we'll see them again so i don't know if that's like a tip off he's maybe he's in big 10 tournament but and then following that uh rico beer tweeted out that uh, it is very likely they will reschedule the game that was canceled. So it looks like they will reschedule. Yeah, he thinks he's saying they will, and he's usually right. He's plugged into the MSU. He knows he wouldn't just say that if he didn't think so. So I think that will get rescheduled. So then Michigan, they already did their reschedule their Purdue one. So things will be tight towards the end of the season. March every other March first, I believe, is the date they're targeting that they think. So we'll see that. I would say also, yeah, that's a, yeah, because that's our. I think that's Michigan State's biggest time in between. We play a Saturday and we don't play again until like a Thursday. So I believe that's the date they're looking at. Satur- you could do a Tuesday in in there. And um, so looking forward quickly, we don't have to do too much because honestly, there's no easy weeks in the Big Ten. But I, for Michigan State, this sets up pretty nice here to really make a run to get. I don't know what the, what, what the standings are right now. Do you guys? What are the standings? Illinois, uh, and Michigan State tied with the same amount, unless Illinois lost recently. No. Okay, so it's Wisconsin and Illinois are tied at eight and two. Michigan State is seven and three. Purdue is seven and three. Michigan State has a really good chance here. You get Maryland on Tuesday and you get Rutgers on Saturday. Really good chance to to win uh, and then be we're, we're seven to two. Eight seven and two, eight and two, seven and two, Purdue seven and three. We're a half game out. Oh. Purdue's a game out. Yeah. Yeah, it just yeah. it just <clears throat> it just changed. I don't know why. Okay. So yeah, seven and two. So good chance really to be nine and two. Um, and I don't know what the other two teams' schedules and are. The only, and the only reason we're half came out is because of that Michigan game. Yeah, Granted, we, we could have lost that. at Chrysler, so it like mute point. But you know the way that we just played, you'd like to think Michigan State probably would have won that game. Um, yeah. So technically, we'll at the rack on Saturday is going to be tough. I'm just going to get that out there. Yep, will be. Maryland got to take care of business there because then it gets the schedule gets harder. Obviously, after that you have Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, three out of four in a stretch there with Penn State mixed in. So you definitely, if you're a Michigan State fan, are expecting and like want needing two wins here to keep on this Big Ten title race because it's going to be tight at the top the rest of the way. Uh, is there any like main thoughts you guys have about either of those games coming up? Maryland is a dumpster fire. You need to beat them. Um, I'll be really disappointed if they lose that game. Uh, just all about energy. You just need to come out with a lot of energy. When you come out flat, this team loses. And I can't have the Marcus Bingham loafer games. I can't have those. It's a, it's a, in the must-win meter. This is a must-win game for both games this week. You should I, go I can't, I 
can't lose. Yeah, it can't go lose. Must win two and zero. Rutgers is ten and two at home this year, so you just gotta start fast. The rack early. is scary. Yeah. Uh, now you're in the heat of it. You just gotta compete every single game and don't take anybody for granted and see what happens. Maryland is a letdown spot, but it's also Maryland, so should cancel out. Should should be fine there. I do get worried about the energy of this team. Wisconsin and Illinois do play each other this week on Wednesday. So oh, there you go. And then One Michigan the State does get Wisconsin next Tuesday. So at home. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot and, of a lot of opportunity in front. And then on the flip side, Michigan will stay on their quest to remain around five hundred in conference play. Try not to dip below it after they had a little good stretch. They get Nebraska. That's pretty much similar to Maryland. Uh, both both that's our a teams cannot lose type no. of game. Both our teams played Tuesday. Those games aren't even fun to watch because you're just on the edge. Like they should blow them out, and if it's close, you're just but rethinking like, everything. Oh God, what are we doing? And then bloodbath usa michigan at purdue saturday at 2 30 um if they win that game i'd be all the way back in that would just be like a suck me right back in and like i'll get hurt again uh so that would be put them to six and four six and four you're you're just kind of hanging around there um well that would be a i mean they win that game they probably get moved into like last four in on lenardi's bubble like that's how like finicky where are they at in the uh the bracketology Mm -hmm. Next four out, but going into the weekend, I believe. Then they lost. So probably like in the next four or the next next four. I don't know. Um, but it's just survive in advance for them. Every game is basically going to just be looked back on in March. They still need like, I don't know. Purdue will tell a lot. If they like compete like they did against Illinois, you can still talk yourself into plucking off some games that can get you in the tournament. But if they get dusted by Purdue... After getting dusted by Michigan State, like two dustings on the row, that's not going to feel good. The updated Joe Lenardi as of 22 hours ago after the loss, Michigan is not in the next, they're not in the first four out, not in the next four out. They're the next team after the next four out. So they're still, still, still the ninth team. Yeah. So they're yeah. not, so they're, really, they're technically off the bubble. They're but we're still, the 73rd ranked team in the country. That's not totally how it works, but yeah. There's hey, 68 teams. Take the good take news, but There's at large spots is a little different. At least we made the page. You know, we're on the page. I've never seen him put the next team on the page, so it might be the brand thing. But I'm the happy brand. you guys made the page. Um, now I think the last thing for the show, and it's just this is gonna be so funny timing. Like if Harbaugh makes an NFL decision tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday, we're just like, oh. Gotta have to wait for our takes for that, but it does seem like smoke is rising. Alex, can you help me with? Well, Evan, you started it. Uh, I'm, I'm doing to, some research. I'm just, as just trying to talking. enjoy my night at a beautiful oh, ski, ski chalet, bad, drinking, enjoying it, and I just get a Harbaugh to the Vikings. I'm like, whoa. Which deep down in my gut, I always thought that was the most like natural spot for him to go. If you think about who Jim Harbaugh is, like a cold weather football guy, like Minnesota made sense. Vegas seemed a little weird for him. Miami felt weird. All these places didn't seem like a good fit. I could see Minnesota, so I got nervous. So we know he confirmed interviewed, which means he's interested. Uh, it just confirms that there's real, real interest. So And now there's a bunch of smoke from more blue chat marks about Miami being in the mix. So I don't know what if you I've guys read. Laid on me. Is so the Miami owner or whatever, he's, a, he's the Michigan business school guy. His, his name Ross. is the business school. Yep. He said that he wasn't going to take Jim away from Michigan in la- like he wasn't going to be the one to take him away. But now that Jim is officially considering NFL jobs because he took an interview with the Vikings, he's now planning to go all in on him because he wouldn't be taking him from Michigan. Jim right. wants to leave. The old like billionaire loophole where you choose yeah. your words very carefully. And uh, the other smoke I just read was that Jim Harbaugh will be having a second interview with Minnesota this week, along with D'Amico Ryans and Kevin O'Connell. Those are the top three for Minnesota. So, Want to hear this wild take? Yes. Mark Carmen at the Carm verified yep. check mark. Um, he's a video host, producer, writer for the Fan Shield. Okay. I did now, read the Windy this one. City Podcast, YouTube, Chicago, Illinois, WGN Radio. He okay. tweeted out this afternoon, hearing from a rival source, okay, whatever that means, Jim Harbaugh would tell his team either today or tomorrow he is leaving for the head coaching job of the Miami Dolphins. Yeah. Could have taken the Minnesota job, preferred Miami. 
Outside chance Michigan pace over the top and stays, but bet on Miami. Mark Carmen is saying that he's going to That Miami. is big. Trying to drop a bomb. It does make you nervous when you see a blue check mark, but I will say this. There was like it was like real talk and smoke that he was going to the Raiders. Like we were sending those texts in the group chat, like my birdies are telling me. This feels me a big, little more real. I don't know, but there was I mean Las he Vegas. officially interviewed for an actual NFL yes. job. The Raiders, yes. there was never anything confirmed. But there was a big there was multiple blue checks marks saying my birdies are telling me it's a massive hire. And they still haven't even didn't they just recently hire their coach? They still haven't. But Josh McDaniels Ooh. is be Josh McDaniel signed a contract today. Okay. Oh, he did. So yeah. yeah. So like I don't know. I don't know who to trust. I'm, I'm in the weeds. Like I see he's got you know like when so he's got like eight thousand followers. Like in my brain, I'm like oh well, that's not that many for a verified guy. Like shush. so <laughs> who knows? He could. It wouldn't surprise me. I will go my current percentage. Everyone throw them out there. I think it's now a true coin flip that he goes. I think it's. I think it's really. Yeah. You know what? No, I think it's sixty forty. He leaves. 70 30. He's leaving. Wow. No, I say it's 60 40. He's staying. 60 40 staying. I like that. I have breaking news out of the Big Ten. Good okay. for good for our schools. I like this. Caleb Williams has informed Wisconsin he will not be going there. No, oh, no. It's not good for wow. us. Wow. Awesome. Wow. There's breaking a lot of family connections, Evan. There was a lot of family There wasn't there's not a lot of family connections. There's only one connection. Hey, I mean, he was interested. He's also not interested in handing the ball off 25 times and being a pro-style offense. Luckily, we don't have to face him. Ooh, not great, Bob. Um, Tyler Higby and Cam Akers are both questionable to return. I did mm. Sony Michelle better. Have Cam Akers anytime touchdown score. Bummer. Feels bad. Um, so I guess we can look forward to in the next episodes. We might have, well, Jim Harbaugh, that would be, that show would do absolutely numbers i feel like that is that would be a polarizing topic where would he go what the future would look like that'd be like well a stafford bomb yeah um we'll have we'll do some trade deadline discussions for the pistons but we might just i don't know we can talk about who we'd like them to go after and then just wait till they make a move similar to the red wings like kind of see if they make any moves um bat- basketball season will keep rolling on and we'll have some super bowl talk as well so we didn't really do questions this week because we record so early, but we'll get back in the listener question game next week uh, at shot of MS on everything, social accounts, all that good stuff. Apple, Spotify, YouTube, where to listen, rate and review on all platforms. The questions, like I said, submit any, we'll, we'll send out the Google form next week. Um, with all that being said, cheers to close out episode 57 and to, um, Joe Burrow. Cheers to Matthew Stafford making his first Super Bowl. Cheers to uh, to Mel Tucker doing big things in recruiting. That's Melvin Tucker to you. Melvin J. G. Tucker the second.